Okay, so uh, let's get started. It's two minutes after the hour. Welcome to our cyber series where we have Mount Sinai faculty present uh, their work to us. Uh, today, I'm very excited about the program uh, that we have uh, upcoming. Uh, this is a unique presentation by two of our star physicians, uh, Sadi Gatan, uh, who is uh, site chair of neurosurgery at Mount Sinai West and an epilepsy surgeon and Lara Marcuse, who co-directs our epilepsy program at Mount Sinai, which is a system-wide program across the Mount Sinai health system, uh, talking about medical and surgical aspects of epilepsy. Uh, we're very excited to have you all present to us and please take it away. I'm gonna get a little space. So you can okay. <laughs> and and uh, we should say that you're beaming from Mount Sinai West. That is correct, and uh, I have the honor of doing this presentation with Lara here on site in the office, and she's wearing an N95 and is greater than six feet away from me, so nobody, uh, nobody be too scared. Excellent. And that looks good. You see our uh, presentations? Yes. Slide, okay. Well, thanks for the opportunity to speak about uh, the work that we have been doing together in the Mount Sinai Health System for almost seven years now, since the establishment of the health system and the joining of forces between what was then Continuum and now is Mount Sinai. And uh, out of about 10 years of my experience uh, prior to that in epilepsy surgery as a surgeon here in New York, I was uh, delighted to be able to join forces with Lara and her team of outstanding epileptologists. And uh, today's lecture takes us through the past six, seven years that we've been working together. There are no disclosures that are relevant to this talk, but credit must be given where credit is due. And first and foremost, I have to thank both the pediatric and adult epilepsy teams that are made up of epileptologists, nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants, assistants administrative assistants, administrative assistants, everything all the way down the line that's critical to the success of our holistic care. Ted Panov has been an first rate outstanding partner to me in our work here and none of this would be possible without his outstanding uh, achievements and his uh, innovations that he's brought to the, the practice and of course the, the biggest credit goes to the courageous patients and their advocates that uh, entrust their care to us as you'll see over the course of our slides. Today's talk is going to give some background on epilepsy surgery perspectives without uh, dwelling too much on the past. We'll talk about how resection remains the mainstay of success. That is an ablative approach to epilepsy surgery when it's possible. But as you'll see from the talk, there are sig significant limitations to that strategy. We're going to go into uh, something that with this collaboration we've established, and, and, and I must emphasize here that this is a team effort that's allowed this to happen. We have tried to change the paradigm of how epilepsy surgery is approached in patients through a neuromodulatory approach, keeping in mind that we still have that option of ablative or resective strategies. But we really wanna open up epilepsy surgery to a much broader population, and we can do that with our neuromodulation program here, specifically in responsive neurostimulation, and then talk about some of the future directions and the uh, research agendas that we have. I wanna start with a very basic and uh, incredibly important uh, reference point, and that is the patient with epilepsy who is suffering the patient who's pictured here in her tattoo, which is difficult to read, but it basically says that she has a vendetta against the person who stabbed her in the back, prompting her to lose consciousness, suffer a traumatic injury, and then develop epilepsy. This patient represents what we see in terms of how 
epilepsy steals a person's life. Now she's already been disenfranchised by the color of her skin and the poverty with which she uh, was raised. She was orphaned. She had a baby that died early in life and she was accused of child abuse and subsequently had all of her children taken from her. And then to top it all off, developed epilepsy. This is not the type of patient that uh, can be offered epilepsy surgery and immediately accept it. This patient uh, required a tremendous holistic effort on the part of the epileptologists who are generous in spirit and the surgeons who can offer something safe, effective, and develop trust with the patient. And as you'll see in the cases that we describe, the suffering is immense when a person has this condition. We know with class one evidence, which is a rare occurrence in uh, the world of neurosurgery, class one randomized controlled studies are extremely rare. We mainly do things based upon prior success but these randomized trials are incredibly important to show that resective or ablative epilepsy surgery is better than medication when epilepsy is deemed intractable. And by that, I mean that if a person has seizures and one anti-seizure medication doesn't work and a second anti-seizure medication is given and that doesn't work to stop the epilepsy, that patient is deemed medically refractory. The chance that the third medication will work is on the order of about 3%. So there is a significant population of patients with epilepsy who need something better than just another medication. And Sam Weeb in Canada in the New England Journal in 2001 produced this elegantly performed randomized trial of temporal lobe surgery for medically intractable seizures that showed superior results to medication. Uh, Pete Engel at UCLA held another one of these randomized trials in adults that concluded in 2012 and showed similar efficacy. And then finally, in 2017, the uh, methods of we were replicated in children to show that it is effective in the pediatric population as well. That is removal of the epileptic tissue and in the classic case, that is this sclerotic, shrunken, scarred hippocampus that's causing mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. You can see in these images the bright signal on flare sequence in the axial and coronal planes that demonstrates a shrunken and scarred hippocampus. And when the patients EEG is concordant with those imaging findings. We're able to approach this in an old school fashion. In this case, this patient had a small incision here just in front of and above the ear and a small craniotomy to remove this tumor with, sorry, this uh, aberrant hippocampus with great results. Seizure free now for the past seven years. There it is for the neuropathologist to dissect and for any eager uh, scientist to explore. But not all cases are that simple. In children, for example, we rarely see pathology in the temporal lobe and therefore most kids have what's called extratemporal epilepsy and multifocal epilepsy, epilepsy that's not just localized to a single focus or even region. In the past, we had to do a big hemispheric exposure like this. And in the picture, the patient is lying on their side. This is the left side of the brain with the temporal lobe here. Can you see my arrow, by the way? Yes, we can see it. Good. Yes, we see it fine. Great, and here's the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the sylvian fissure. And in this case, we're going on a fact-finding mission with subdural electrodes that are placed on the cortical surface and strips that go 
into the less accessible areas like the middle fossa, the anterior cranial fossa. Well, we also combine these sorts of evaluations, which again are fact finding. The patient comes into the hospital, they undergo this big operation to place these electrodes. In this case, now we've added depth electrodes in a patient right, with tuberous sclerosis to be able to monitor from various tubers in the frontal and parietal lobes. And in a case like this, the patient's dura is augmented, their scalp is stitched back together after the bone's been replaced, and they stay with us for about a week in the epilepsy monitoring unit having seizures so that we can essentially do brain mapping. We figure out where the seizures are coming from and distinguish those from functional areas using, using both recordings and stimulation. And come back to the operating room with a plan to either take out or disconnect that seizure onset zone. Here is a patient who had undergone a right-sided craniotomy for exposure of the right temporal, frontal, parietal lobes. We found a broad network between frontal and temporal lobes, and this elegant piece of uh, silk here outlines the epileptogenic zone. And this patient has a very invasive looking frontal and temporal disconnection and removal. And one might gasp in horror at the invasiveness of this approach, but when it's compared to the invasiveness of epilepsy, there is no doubt that anything that we're doing, invasive as it is in these situations, still is better than a lifetime of epilepsy. And yet we're not gonna get very many patients that way. It's a very difficult and tall order to come into the hospital, endure pain, endure the risk of having that kind of a hemispheric exposure, where in some cases, unlike those that were studied in the randomized trials, the success rate's not that great. Now, recently, we've borrowed from the Europeans who have been using a different technique for intracranial monitoring, and that is this methodology called stereo EEG, stereotactic depth electrode placement, which was popularized by Taylorac and Van Co in the 50s. They have this uh, somewhat barbaric looking equipment that uh, you see in the photo here, but the patient has the pleasure of being able to smoke his way through the study. It is a much less invasive way of getting intracranial recordings. We now have robotic navigation that eases the efficiency and the safety of lead placement. And of course, there's tremendous satisfaction. Prior to the advent of stereo EEG, when we had cases where we weren't certain about what side of the brain the seizures were coming from, because with video EEG, this is not always clear, we had the option to place two little burr holes, one here at the temporal region and one here at the coronal suture to be able to place strip electrodes in a montage that sort of looks like this. And the best we could do with these intracranial electrodes was determine laterality. You can see there's significant real estate that's missing in our analysis here. At best, we could come up with a regional distribution for the patient's epilepsy. But now with stereo EEG, we have an efficient robotic navigator that takes us to each of the locations where we're going to implant an electrode and an elegant global positioning system that allows us to place these electrodes without hitting blood vessels. We can sample deep structures. We can sample both sides simultaneously. And while the Europeans would consider this sort of an approach a fishing expedition, where we're placing lots of electrodes on both sides, we view it more as if we are going for an analysis of the epilepsy network. We've gotten away now 
from thinking about epilepsy as a focal onset in an abnormal brain region that then leads to seizures. And no longer is it true that we can search for that focal onset, ablate it, take it out and be rid of epilepsy for many, many of our patients. Here's some pictures that show the methodology. Uh, we don't have to shave the head to do this. We uh, still use this barbaric looking skull clamp, but the patient's under general anesthesia. Uh, there's our wonderful scrub nurse, Michelle, who was very apprehensive of having to do battle with the robot, but it turns out everybody's happy in the end. These take about three minutes each to place. And there's Ted lining up a registration with uh, optical registration that uh, really gives us submillimetric accuracy with the placement. It hurts less. The incisions are all tiny on the order of two to three millimeters. And we get probably better results in terms of our mapping and our monitoring. So with that introduction into how we do our fact finding and how it has evolved really beginning in about 2015, I want to show a case that demonstrates the multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary uh, expertise that's necessary to get this right sometimes. And when you get it right, you really uh, end up walking away with a great feeling of satisfaction. Uh, patient JR was referred to us, a young woman who has two small children. Uh, she has uh, a significant seizure history in terms of uh, the number of years, and the burden is great on a daily basis. She has what we would refer to as uh, focal impaired aware uh, seizures at the beginning that sometimes generalize. Here is an example of her seizure. Here she is in the EMU. And uh, we don't show that for dramatic uh, effect, but rather to, to simply demonstrate that the burden of living with this condition is significant, that it affects family members, it affects the patient, it, it's gonna certainly affect uh, her relationship, her ability to work, her ability to be productive and have independence over the course of her life. And so we undertake a big workup. In this case, she had a 1.5 Tesla MR at another center, and then a seven Tesla MR with us and uh, Preeti's uh, program. And it demonstrated to us that there was this area of focal cortical dysplasia affecting her dominant hemisphere just behind her primary sensory area. With this information to hand, we were able to bring her to the operating room and do an awake operation in coordination with our epileptologists and our neuropsychologists. And of course, our anesthesiologists who provided uh, comfortable and uh, uh, tolerable environment for undergoing an operation while awake. And together we were able to remove this lesion, which turned out to be a very low grade neoplasm rather than a dysplasia. And we're pleased to report that now going on four years, she's seizure free and doing beautifully. But as Dr. Marcuse is about to show you, it's not always so easy. Dr. Marcuse. Okay, well, thank you all for inviting me. We're gonna switch tacks right now and talk a little bit about brain stimulation and sort of the history of how we began to use brain stimulation for the treatment of epilepsy. And of course, we're really gonna talk about deep brain stimulation and responsive uh, stimulation for this talk. But I just wanna remind you all that we're stimulating our brains all the time. Everything we do stimulates the brain. 
And it's possible that things that we do might make us more or less likely to have a seizure. All epilepsy doctors have patients with reflex epilepsy that will always have a seizure with a certain type of stimulation. So there are people that have seizures with flashing lights. That's not that uncommon. I have a patient that always will have a seizure on Yom Kippur when he reads that particular portion of the Torah. Um, and there are people that will have seizures with deep brain stimulation, depending on the setting. And deep brain stimulation can prevent seizures. Cortical stimulation can cause seizures and cortical stimulation can prevent seizures. So what I really want us to start thinking about is this knife's edge between pro-convulsant and anti-convulsant. Um, this was a paper that Marty Morell was on a long time ago in 2005 that just began to ask the question, why would stimulation stop seizures? Perhaps it preferentially releases inhibitory neurotransmitters, maybe. Maybe it inactivates neurons in the vicinity of the electrode by over depolarization. So then those neurons don't really work. Or maybe it's even more complicated than these two ideas. Early days of brain stimulation were kind of, when you look at early papers, and I'm just going to show a few of them, they were very contradictory. So this was a really wonderful paper from 1997, where if you were stimulating a rat at 100 hertz in the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, you would require a lot more of this pro-convulsant agent, PTZ, to make them have a seizure. But if you stimulated them in the same place, but at a low frequency, they would be more likely to have a seizure. And that concept is with us today, that we worry that low frequency stimulation in the thalamus may be pro-convulsant and high frequency stimulation would work better. However, um, in another rat model, many years later, the animals did not do better with anterior nucleus uh, stimulation. This was a totally different um, epilepsy model. And in fact, the only rats that did okay were the rats where, they, where the surgeons had missed the target and the electrodes were not in the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. So confusing. Human studies were equally confusing. And again, this has been going on for a long time. This paper is from 1987. There was anterior nucleus stimulation that looked like it worked in some people with really difficult epilepsy. And then in a, in a later paper in 2002, people had implantation into the thalamus and it looked like it helped kind of, but it didn't matter whether they were in a period of time where the electrodes were turned on or in a period of time where the electrodes were turned off. So the big turnaround for this was the paper that was published in 2010, which was the deep brain stimulation um, paper in the anterior nucleus of the thalamus for refractory epilepsy. This was the Sante trial. They had a three month blinded period where people either received stimulation or they did not receive stimulation. And um, the group that got stimulation had a much greater reduction in seizure frequency. So this was really when, we, when, the, when the data began to get convincing. And the longer the people had this anterior nucleus uh, uh, stimulation, the better the reduction in seizure frequency. So it was 43% at one year and 68% at five years. So there's a sense of some neuromodulation occurring. And 16% of subjects were seizure free. And I wanna just kind of note that, that this isn't the same as resection where Dr. Gatan is able to make people truly seizure free. This is much less likely to render somebody seizure free completely, but it is likely to make them much better. There was uh, a sense, uh, the, the follow-up studies for the Sante trial showed us that people's quality of life is better, but with stimulation in the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, there was quite an impressive signal for depression in some patients that I think we're still trying to sort of figure out. Um, there's, we're now gonna talk about responsive neurostimulation. So this is, this idea, this concept for responsive neurostimulation, it was actually born out of brain mapping. So this is the same patient that Dr. Gatan uh, just showed. After we collect seizures, we actually stimulate the electrodes in pairs. Um, and this on the screen here is my stimulation. And just like I said in my first slide, stimulation can ready? cause a seizure. <laughs> 
So I stimulate her. Yes. She gets the and sensation of her typical off. seizure. It kind of goes like this. And... I don't know. I have to stop doing that. Um, and then, it hmm, it's, it's very sensitive. The next time I stimulate her, let me see, I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna press is it play. Okay, I'm not touching the mouse because it's very sensitive. Um, the next time I stimulate her, I actually cause a seizure. Okay, let's just do that one more time. And Jake, you look at, you, do you want to look at her That's and, Jake and, Young look, I'm and talking then I'll look to? here and see if it's a seizure or if it's just a stimulation. One more time, you see if she moves. We're at a very low stimulation. And... So I stimulate her brain, her arm moves. Okay. And then on the next slide, she, you can see the seizure. And then I start to deliver little pulses of stimulation to try to stop it. Okay, we're done. And the seizure stops. Okay, so good. I didn't discover this when she was having surgery in 2000. Are and, you ready? Um, uh, whenever it was, 15. This is actually an incredible paper from 1999 when they looked at people that were getting brain mapping and some clinicians would do that burst of stimulation when uh, they, they had caused a seizure and some epileptologists would not. And, they d and this is a good example of, this is the stimulation by the epilepsy doctor, this is the seizure developing, and this is the, stim the second stimulation that's meant to abort the seizure, and it does. So, it was out of this, this was the proof of concept paper that said we might wanna place a device that can sense a seizure and stop it in its tracks. In truth, the device is probably much more complicated the way it truly works than this, but this was the beginning of the concept. Okay, um, so uh, we use, and the responsive neurostimulator came out before the deep brain stimulator because um, really because of, stuff with the FDA. And then the responsive neurostimulator provides us with all of this data. And in some ways we've fallen in love with it and we use it a lot more than, than DBS. And it, in, in, it's more of a cultural eddy than anything else because DBS can work quite well too. But I'll show you some of the things that RNS has done for us that's somewhat surprising. We use the RNS device if a patient has more than one seizure onset zone. So we don't wanna take out more than one area of brain surgically, or if it's in an area that we cannot be removed because we wanna talk and we wanna move our bodies and we want our patients to do that. Um, the device is programmed to detect the person's typical seizure onset and we refine detection over time. When we have good detection, then we start stimulating the seizures to stop them. And we're really not stimulating seizures, we're stimulating the beginning parts of what may become a seizure. Um, this is the people across the country that are using this device. This is Mount Sinai here. We have over a hundred patients with this device in place. We um, use it almost as much as Stanford, which is where it was sort of originated. So we're pretty successfully using this device. This device gives us a tremendous amount of information. So this is what I see when I, I can log into any computer and see any of my patients and look at all of this raw um, brainwave data that gets stored from the device. The patient is home, very sensitive. The patient is home and just puts this wand over their head and uploads all this data to me. And all of these little uh, ECOGs are stored for my review. And that really has been revolutionary. And if you talk to the people at Neuropace, this was almost added on as an aside. It wasn't, it was thought maybe this will be a little bit helpful. And it's been um, kind of an incredible journey to see these things. This is the uh, prospective outcomes of the RNS device at year nine. And again, we have 73% have achieved a greater than 50% uh, seizure reduction at year nine. Um, and 35% have a greater than 90% seizure reduction. Again, it's very, very good. And the really nice thing about it is it gets better with time. Many people have a period of time without clinical seizures. 
and the quality of life metrics and cognitive outcomes improve. Um, what's interesting is the responder rate uh, and seizure onset zone, um, it doesn't really matter where your seizures are coming from. It could be mesial temporal, it could be neocortical, um, people get better. Um, this was from the prospective trial over here, and the numbers are really sort of the same. And this was a retrospective analysis of regional onset epilepsy, and this includes um, Sinai data. We were not part of the prospective trial. The truth is that no one's quite saying out loud is that bilateral hippocampal are probably a little bit more refractory than neocortical epilepsy to the responsive neurostimulator. So because I have these ECOGs, I have a world more of information that is kind of shedding light into the darkness. I feel like I worked in black and white and now I work in color when I have this device, it, particularly for this patient population that is pretty tough. This is a paper that um, is really interesting that shows that we've always known that like, we think that women may have cycles where they're more likely to have seizures because of their progesterone and their estrogen. And what this paper showed was it's not just women. Many people have multi-day rhythms. This up and down black line is showing increases that we can see on the RNS, very sensitive, very sensitive, of epileptiform activity. And the red dots are the person's clinical seizures. And people have their clinical seizures when they're getting more of their epileptiform activity. And everybody has these cycles. And now we can see it and we can begin to think about it and plan around it. This is a patient that I take care of and she has bilateral hippocampal depth electrodes. And since she's had them in, she has not had a clinical seizure. So she's a, like sort of a super responder but she does sometimes have seizures that I can see on the RNS. And you might think that this pattern is related to her menstrual cycle or something. So these, um, some of these green lines here are actually seizures, not all of them. And to tell the part, you really have to dig into the raw data and take a look at the morphology. And as epilepsy doctors, we're very used to doing that. She is super sensitive to when she goes out and drinks the night before. And the only time she has these seizures, which are truly subclinical, or after a night of drinking or a bachelorette party or something like that. And we've truly gotten to know that. Um, and she lives with her boyfriend or her mom and no one has ever seen a seizure, even though I sometimes see a seizure. And not everybody is sensitive like this to alcohol and poor sleep. And it's like very, very direct. Like I'll say, what happened on you know June 19th? And she'll be like, oh, on the 18th, I picked up an extra shift. I worked till four in the morning. And it's like a very direct correlation for her. On the left is an example of an ECOG where it really doesn't develop into a seizure. This is, a, this is some compressed brain waves that I took a picture of from RNS. That did not develop into a seizure. And this is one that did develop into a seizure coming from her right hippocampus. So we can really tell when we dig into the raw data what's a seizure and what's not. But it's a subclinical seizure, so I don't really do anything about it because these have been happening for millennium and we haven't known about it and now we know about it. Another example is this woman. This is somebody that's not responding well and continues to have seizures. She hasn't had as many tonic-clonic seizures, but she does have um, focal impaired aware seizures. These seizures, um, with her, she has, with her, she, she walks, she's a beautiful woman. She used to be a teacher. She can't work because of her epilepsy. As I was seeing these events on her device, it turns out that she's been having all of these experiences that we didn't think were seizures that are in fact seizures. So an example, she's standing in front of her closet. She cannot figure out what she should wear. She's feel, thinking too much about her aunt, a very powerful sensation of her aunt for just a few moments and then it passes. She never thought to report that to me. It didn't really reach a threshold, but it turns out that those experiences, which are different depending on where she is in this world, where she's standing, are actually seizures. And it's sort of her form of deja vu. And when they come from the left temporal lobe, she more gets a wave of anxiety. So now I'm learning about this, but she's somebody that I don't think that we're treating fully and we're not helping the device. There are times when the device doesn't help enough. That does happen. Um, 
the other thing that we can use this data for is I can give people a new medicine. And if it starts to decrease their long episodes on the RNS device, which I can see within a week, that medicine is likely to work for them. If the device doesn't do everything, the medicines that are working the best with the device are levetiracetam and clobazam. This is an example of a patient. I started Sonobamate here. His long episodes went down. Sonobamate has worked unbelievably well. And he's now, he went from having a seizure like two to three times a week. And now he's having a seizure um, like once um, a month. So it's working incredibly well. And I could, I could tell that it was going to work from the very beginning, from the very first time that medicine touched his mouth, I could tell that it was going to work. When we talk about stuff, when we give talks, a lot of times we give the most clean version of everything. So I just want to take you into the gutter of clinical work with me. I've really enjoyed some recent talks I've had by recent talks I've heard by some of the scientists um, at FBI. And I think clinical work is just messy. So this is a woman, she's 24 years old and she began to have what she felt like were anxiety attacks. Um, these were actually seizures. With every anxiety attack, she would urinate on herself. I want you guys to tell me if you can tell when she's having a seizure. I'll give you a hint. In a seizure, she always says, I just can't. And she's in the middle of explaining to her friends why she thinks that she's not having seizures, but she's just having anxiety attacks. Well, that's that's last. And they're two, like right in between periods. They have something you should worry about. I don't, I'm not the only one, you know. And then my other friend is like, hey, I was working out and I think I had the same thing you did. Like, I think you're fine. Like, I don't think it's what, and I was like, okay, so all my friends at work are like looking this stuff up for me. Alex is like, don't worry, babe. You're not, I don't think it's, a, I think you're okay. All of our friends are saying that they have experienced or know people are Googled it too. And well, because they were the first time. I know, but I can't, I know, but I can't. So it's fine. So that's her seizure. And she always says, I just can't, I just can't, I just can't. And she always urinates in herself, even though she's not a tonic-clonic seizure. Her MRI was normal. Her video EEG was not very helpful. Her PET scan was normal. She had stereo EEG. We captured seizures on stereo EEG. They're very, very broad. And of course you guessed it from her left hemisphere because oh. that's where her language is. Sorry. She had RNS electrodes placed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you want to, want to, but you can. I feel sorry and I feel and guilty. She continued to have seizures. I'm listening to a lecture right now that I'm supposed to be at. I'm going to try. Eight seizures per day. Um, so she had this device in for almost a year and she was continuing to have seizures. We were changing little things. Um, it was pretty tough. That's the device. She had one in her, she had one electrode in her hippocampus, but the ones that were turned on was one that was on her lateral temporal lobe on the left and in her frontal lobe. This is an example of uh, what her ECOGs looked like. This is a kind of a bigger seizure where the amplitude goes up. So you see that yellow, which is saturation. All of these TXs mean she is getting stimulation, but it's not working, it's not stopping it. This is a smaller seizure that doesn't get saturated. There's no yellow, but a seizure it is. And the, the device is like kind of picking it up pretty good, but a, like I wanted it a little bit sooner um, at one of the visits that I was at. So I made this tiny change to her bandpass filter where I changed the minimum frequency from 26 to 23, a very small change. And you can run a simulation when you do this and it didn't look like it would blow up her sensitivity. And at the same visit, which I normally don't do, I normally don't do two things at once, but I've been working with her for a year and it seemed like such a tiny change I was making to her detection, I added clobazam. So we went from 650 detections per day, which is pretty typical with the RNS device, to 4,000 detections per day and stimulation. So every time you detect, you stimulate. And this is a good example of how a small perturbation in the initial condition of a system results in large changes in later, condition, later conditions. So a little chaos theory. And her record becomes, we 
we get all these detections, all these detections. But in fact, now she's seizure free. So since I changed detection, I can't use this as a metric, but she became completely seizure free. And why is that? Because what are we detecting right now? Normal brain waves. What are we stimulating right now? Normal brain waves. Sometimes she gets epileptiform activity that we're stimulating, but we're stimulating a lot of normal brain waves. So if you look at the saturations, you can see that those went completely away. This is the saturations, the bigger seizures. Those went completely away with the change in the way the RNS device was working and with the change in the medication. So I wanna ask you right now, she's getting 4,000 stimulations per day. The main side effect of that means that Dr. Gatan might need to replace her battery sooner. And she's often getting stimulation for brain waves that are normal. So should we change that detection? So here are some of the beliefs that might affect that decision. If you think the device works by stopping individual seizures, you might change it because it's not, it's just, it's just uh, stimulating normal brain waves. If you think that it works by neuromodulation, you'd leave it alone because you would say those stimulations are doing something for her that we don't quite understand yet. If you think it's the addition of the clobazam, you might change the stimulation and make it more, sens more specific, less sensitive. But one of the things that is, uh, happens as a clinician is that you're very grateful for success and, you, and I feel very humble that I don't understand everything and I tread lightly around success. She's 100% uh, fine with us using her picture. This is her. She hasn't had a seizure in a year and a half. And the, one of her favorite things is she doesn't wear diapers anymore and she's able to try to get more work as an actress. Um, and that's the end of my part, I believe. Thank you, Lara. So uh, as I had <clears throat> warned you, not all cases uh, go so well. And I guess Laura said it elegantly that, that uh, clinical practice can be messy. Here, uh, a slide entitled The Hail Marty is a reference to Marty Morell, who uh, is the medical director at Neuropace. We had a patient, a 14 year old with Lennox Gastaut epilepsy and autism, uh, who had undergone really the gamut of what epilepsy surgery could throw at him. Uh, frontal lobectomy at a outside hospital, a corpus callosotomy by me when I was at Columbia Presbyterian, a vagus nerve stimulator, then bilateral intracranial monitoring like I showed you, and then a unilateral implant, everything very invasive, a palliative temporal lobectomy and a big prior to occipital disconnection, and he's still having seizures. He's still suffering. He's still out of control from a behavioral standpoint. Yeah. So at that stage in 2015, with no prior experience with responsive neurostimulation, and again, no experience with stereo EEG monitoring, this was our only option. We placed the very first responsive neurostimulator in a child in the United States and therefore the world. We placed at our best guess where we were going to make the biggest effect, which was going to be the dominant left frontal lobe and the non-dominant right temporal lobe. That's almost all that was left. We also placed depth electrodes in the anterior nucleus of the thalamus in the hope that perhaps someday we could influence a wider circuit. And lo and behold, within the first year of this approach, we had better results than all of those destructive operations combined. Now we had a good experience in taking care of patients who had autism and other patients who had genetic epilepsies and developmental delay as a comorbidity to their epilepsy. And we found that in all of those cases where we could achieve success with somebody who did not have autism, we could achieve that same success in the autistic patient. And 
dramatically change their behavior for the better and help with their developmental progress. But we encountered really futility in the patients who had non-lesional epilepsy, in the patients who, in whom we may have thought that they had lateralized their seizures or regionalized their seizures. And through those old school ablative or disconnective surgeries, we really were achieving about 30 to 40% success, which is a tall ask for a patient's family who is going to entrust their care to you to do something that is irretrievable. So this is where speaking as a father and speaking as a clinician, I would say that the option of a neuromodulatory approach, something that can be built upon, something that can be reversible if it needs to be, is infinitely more palatable. And we published the first two children that we had implanted, which were the first two responsive neurostimulators in this series of over 100 that are referred to. One of them, uh, uh, who was eight years old at the time, had a seizure focus that was involving her dominant language and motor area. And of course, resection in that area was not an option. And she went on to become seizure free in two years. The first patient that I described, he still struggles, but he's still much better than he was again with any of those destructive operations. We applied this to another nearly 30 pediatric patients over the course of the next five years. And Ted Panov uh, and the group just published this paper in the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics, demonstrating not just safety, but a significant gain in efficacy. And just like with the pivotal trial that Laura talked about where the success rate gets better with time, we have found that that is also the case in children and perhaps even a little bit quicker. Maybe that's based upon our experience with NeuroPACE and the experience that the epileptologists have gained. I wanna make sure everybody understands that all the heavy lifting in these cases is done by the neurologist and not by the surgeon. Placement of these electrodes and these devices is the simple part. It is that day-to-day -day analysis of the patient's electrocorticogram, working with them with their medications that is making all of the difference in these cases. But it is not a risky op operation and it is not an invasive operation. We've had an infection rate that is commensurate with other uh, stimulator implants in children, no greater. By the time a child is two, their cranial dimensions are ve getting very near to maturity, and therefore there is not any significant risk in placing this device in a young child. I mentioned Lennox Gastaut, which for those of you who aren't familiar is really one of the catastrophic epilepsies of childhood. It is multifocal. The seizure semiology can be variable. It can be both related to a lesion in the brain and we can also see it in cases where there is no lesion. But experimental evidence tells us that there is a strong relationship between the central median nucleus of the thalamus and the frontal neocortex. And so working with NeuroPACE, we're one of six centers that has been included in this UG3, UH3 grant to study the placement of bilateral devices. We're gonna put in bilateral responsive neurostimulators with depth electrodes in the central median nucleus of the thalamus and another electrode in the frontal neocortex. One will act as a detector, that is the frontal electrode, and then the central median nucleus electrode acts as the neuromodulatory electrode. We recently published on this in a 
paper with two kids who have this phenotype, both presented to us with Lennox Gasto, and it turns out both have autism. Now, if you go back to those early slides that I showed where we use this resective approach and we get these great results, again, our experience in the autism series show that this is not the case in this population. Patient one in this series, in fact, had undergone that sort of paradigm. And when the NYU pediatric neurosurgeon told mom, there's really nothing I can take out, she insisted that he remove at least a small portion of her right frontal lobe. And of course, that was to no effect. The second patient saw a small spot on CBS Saturday morning that illustrated the young patient that we placed the responsive neurostimulator in for her eloquent cortical region. And because that case was so delayed in getting into the press and online because of uh, our former president, the patient had become seizure free. Now mom saw this commercial, or sorry, this, this spot on CBS Sunday morning, Saturday morning, and immediately called and said, I'm afraid that my child is gonna die of sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, and I want this device. Well, that started a one year journey to get that placed in uh, the patient with stereo EEG, and we've had just an, a, a, an extremely gratifying uh, diminution in the seizures. We've learned from patient one and applied to patient two, where the courageous Maddie Fields, epileptologist extraordinaire, started uh, detections and stimulations while the patient was still in the hospital. We typically wait a, a couple of months before we do it. But in this case, it was so clear we could detect from the central median nucleus of the thalamus. And this sweet guy went from having 50 seizures a day to four in two weeks. His quality of life has dramatically improved and the severity of his autism has really also drastically changed for the better. Here's the demonstration of the central median nucleus. I have to uh, give credit to Ted Panov again for his excellence in uh, stereotactic planning and the safety and the minimal invasive, minimally invasive methods by which we're able to place these. It's, it's, it's a very uh, gratifying and satisfying uh, endeavor. Uh, we also are working with a couple of other centers around the country to uh, show that responsive neurostimulation is, is a viable option for this autistic population in whom there are not better options. And we have seen steady and good improvement in those patients with reductions in their seizures, reductions certainly in their ER admissions and hospital admissions and major changes in their quality of life. And so what we've had to do in this modern era is also adjust our expectations a little bit where we're not going for the home runs of the patients who are seizure free, who by the way, invariably also in that population drop off over time. In contrast, whereas those patients who undergo lesional or ablative surgeries start having seizures five and 10 years out, patients with RNS only seem to be having improvements in their seizure free, in their seizure uh, control as the years go by. That graph continues to show that we're getting better seizure control year by year. So we're working with five other centers on this and Maddie is, uh, as the lead author on this has, has submitted it. Uh, this patient, Sadie G is a very special young lady in whom we applied the uh, responsive neurostimulation paradigm to for another catastrophic epilepsy of childhood. Sadie uh, was featured in a show uh, called Diagnosis on Netflix, where we placed an RNS in the setting of Rasmussen encephalitis. She'd undergone a biopsy at another hospital that showed that she had this condition in the right hemisphere. 
She was in epilepsy and partialis continua and her dominant hand, the left hand was the one that was uh, being affected so severely by the epilepsy. That shows her now, uh, I guess, almost two years out from the RNS thriving. She's still uh, drawing and writing with her left hand and here she is diligently working away. Oop. It's sensitive. It is, it's Four, my mouse. 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. Toe taps. Okay, one, two, three. You can see that she still has some hemiparesis in the leg, but she has not followed the course of catastrophic loss of function in that right hemisphere that patients with Rasmussen typically undergo. And we have a second patient that we've treated by this method also, who is about seven years out from his surgery now, sorry, six years out from his surgery, and he's also doing very well. So uh, this, this is, I am optimistic, uh, a way to, again, change the paradigm away from the destructive sorts of approaches to epilepsy surgery to something more palatable and more useful across the board. So our future directions that we're engaged in right now are formal uh, studies of our use of RNS in the thalamus. Of course, as I said, this is a great way to influence a much broader network of epilepsy and network epilepsy is really where it's at nowadays in terms of our ability to serve a big population. We're also involved in placing this in the setting of generalized epilepsy and incredibly functional people who are, again, paralyzed uh, and held hostage to their seizure disorder. And then we're also chosen as a center of excellence for RNS in children and we're involved in the FDA's prospective study for the use of RNS in children in the hopes that it'll be rapidly uh, <clears throat> approved for use in, in the pediatric age group. We're using it off label and have had great success with it. And in, if you ask my opinion, it is uh, really ideally suited to children uh, who unlike me, who you can't teach an old dog a new trick, their brains are especially plastic and receptive to this sort of training. Thank you for your attention. We've finished with two minutes left for questions. And uh, once again, thanks to our big team that works so perfectly together. Fantastic. Sadi and Laura, thank you so much. It was wonderful for me to see the advances in epilepsy diagnosis and treatment, uh, a different world compared to what I was trained with uh, years ago in medical school. Uh, we're pretty much out of time, but let's have time for one question if somebody wants to raise a question and otherwise uh, Lara and Saadi are available to address your questions otherwise. Does anyone want to ask a question? Just uh, unmute yourselves and speak up. Hey, Dr. Gatan and Dr. Marcuse, uh, this is Alejandro. I uh, was wondering what's been the greatest challenge of developing these technologies of, as we've adapted to stereo EG and treated these patients with RNS? Alejandro, I think one of the biggest hurdles that I had certainly was changing the way I had done things from my training and the first 10 years of my career. I definitely had significant anxiety in adopting new techniques using a robot and asking my colleagues in neurology to adopt a new way of looking at the electrocorticogram. Thank God I have <laughs> the collaboration with epileptologists like Lara and that I have a partner like Ted Panov who uh, calms my jangled nerves. I would say the hardest thing for me is it's quite alarming how many people, how many seizures people are having that they don't know about. So it's hard to open your eyes and see what is actually happening sometimes it's hard to see that this is what's truly happening in the brains of the patients that I take care of, particularly this drug resistant epilepsy group.
you know, Laura, that was one of my takeaways from the presentation today is, is how presentation of seizures is very different from the classic presentation I was taught. Definitely. You know, we as clinicians need to be much more aware of these non-tonic clonic seizures that patients might be experiencing on such a frequent basis that it disrupts their lives. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you both again very, very much. I enjoyed that tremendously. Uh, thank you all for joining us and have a good rest of the week, everybody. Bye-bye.